Hi, everybody. I'm really happy to be able to share with you the first part of my interview with Reverend Dr. Johanna Katanasho, the academic dean of Nazareth Evangelical College in Nazareth, Israel. Before we begin, however, please be sure to subscribe to the channel to ring the bell so that you can be notified when videos like this appear in the future. And please be sure to share this interview on social media. I want to welcome everybody who is watching this interview. It's my pleasure to have with me uh, the Reverend Dr. Johanna Katanasho, who is the academic dean at Nazareth Evangelical College. He is a Palestinian Israeli evangelical who has studied at Bethlehem University, where he earned a Bachelor of Science, Wheaton College, where he earned a Master of Arts, and Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, where he earned a Master of Divinity and a PhD. He's also the author of The Land of Christ, A Palestinian Cry, published in 2013, Praying Through the Psalms, published in 2018, and Reading the Gospel of John Through Palestinian Eyes, published in 2020, which is going to be the principal focus of our talk today. So, uh, Reverend Dr. Katanasho, I want to welcome you and thank you for making the time to be here to talk about your work and your book with us. It is my pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, before we get started, um, talking about your book on the Gospel of John, reading the Gospel of John through Palestinian eyes. Please tell the audience a little bit about yourself. So I read your bio, a short bio there. You're a Palestinian Israeli evangelical. Um, it's pretty safe to assume that there are very few Americans who actually know Palestinian Israeli evangelicals. Talk to us about what that means, your experience growing up, the things that shaped you, um, and, and some of those important experiences that have made you into who you are today. Sure, sure. Thank you, uh, Chris. Um, first of all, you know, people always uh, have assumptions and uh, labels carry a lot of uh, sometimes uh, biases, assumptions, uh, threats sometimes to certain people. Um, I just, uh, I live in a context where every definition of who I am creates some form of enmity. <laughs> so, so, so the thing is, uh, uh, I just want to uh, at least state it in a very simple way. Culturally and historically, I am a Palestinian. The way I eat, the way I dance, the way I, uh, you know, the way we, we go to funerals, to weddings, uh, we eat hummus, we eat falafel, uh, <laughs> we have, uh, this is our Palestinian culture. So I am Palestinian. Historically, I am also Palestinian. My historical roots, the way I'm connected to the land, my language, my accent, and these are not necessarily political, it's just a matter of my identity, my cultural and historical identity. In terms of citizenship, I have an Israeli passport, so I am an Israeli citizen. I can vote, I can move in the country, I shape some of the political realities within the country through voting and through other means. Uh, and my neighbors are Jews, I interact with them, I speak Hebrew, I speak Arabic, and I speak English, obviously. So, uh, so these are some of uh, the characteristics of my identity as an Israeli. Uh, and uh, also there is an Israeli culture. So I am a bicultural by nature. On the one hand, I'm Palestinian. On the other hand, I'm Israeli as well. So, uh, so I am combining these two things. Again, that's not necessarily uh, political, but it has political implications in terms of at least identity, travel, uh, living, taxes, all of these issues. Um, in terms of uh, my religious identity, I am an evangelical by choice that I have chosen to follow the evangelical faith. Um, and basically what this means for me, because also this label has so many different meanings right. all over the world, uh, it basically means that I'm committed to a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and that I uh, take the Bible 
both testaments, Old and New Testament, seriously in terms of shaping my identity, the identity of my community, and the way I follow Jesus Christ. So this is, uh, in a nutshell, these identities. I just want to add that sometimes these identities are in conflict with each other. My Palestinian identity, with my Israeli identity, my even evangelical identity. Uh, and uh, so I have to be a peacemaker and to work continually on uh, defining who I am in relation to my Lord. So my identity is dynamic, is not static. So it's, it's not like uh, uh, sometimes when I go to an Israeli, uh, uh, for example, airport, I am basically an Israeli because that's what I have. I have an Israeli passport. But when I go, for example, to Egypt and I meet some fellow Arabs there, I'm basically a Palestinian because that's basically the language and the food and the way to connect and build bridges. So it is, um, it is really confusing how to uh, define myself, but it is static. It's not static. It's dynamic depending on the situation. Now, at the core of my identities, I want to bring Christ to all of my identities and in a way to sanctify these identities because none of them are sinful in essence. That means that the identity can be sanctified but not rejected. Right. So it's not like I want to reject my Israeli identity or reject my Palestinian identity or reject my evangelical identity. I want it to be shaped in a way that pleases my Lord. Sorry, this is a long answer to a simple question. All over the world, you can easily define who you are, but here it's a little bit more complex. Well, it's, it's actually very helpful uh, from my perspective, because as I hear you talking, I'm thinking back to some passages in the New Testament where Jesus and Paul, for instance, um, are living biculturally. You know, when uh, Jesus is presented with a coin and is asked about the question of taxes, there's an issue of biculturalism there that he has to address and navigate very carefully. Paul, using his, his Roman citizenship, for instance, that directly impacted his ministry uh, in many ways, especially at the end by appealing unto Caesar and dealing with that conflict in Jerusalem that way. So do you think you look at certain passages in the New Testament differently than perhaps some other believers around the world because of uh, your experience living in two cultures simultaneously? Absolutely, absolutely. I, um, um, in, in my book, we might come to this later in the Gospel of John, um, I, um, at least, I, I feel and I see uh, there are uh, some evidence that will, argue, that will help me to argue that John is, is experiencing an identity question. He's experiencing some struggle with the identity and with, with the community as well later, the, the, the followers of Jesus. The followers of Jesus come from a Jewish background. Now, they are followers of Jesus, and the majority, it seems that the majority have not accepted the interpretation that focuses on Jesus as the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies. And so, and so they are uh, experiencing a, a conflict between their Jewish identity and their new identity in Christ. And their new identity in Christ, it's opening up to include, for example, nations that didn't come from Jewish background. And so they have to restructure their social relationships. They have to restructure their expectations. Uh, they have to restructure their commitments and their loyalties. And so it is, uh, uh, it is uh, difficult and dynamic that reshaping their identity. This is where I see a lot of the I am saying in the Gospel of John, reflecting actually issues related to identity. Um, so in addition to that, 
I would uh, I I would see that uh, in the Gospel of John we see followers of Jesus Christ living as a minority among a Jewish majority. And so uh, this reality actually does not exist any other place in the world except in Israel today, where, where uh, we, uh, we as followers of Christ in Israel are a minority among a Jewish majority. I mean, I'm not sure if uh, if New York will qualify, but uh, but I would say Israel is clearly a, a, a place where this happens, where you have a a Christian minority living among a Jewish majority, and uh, living in the same land in which Christ lived. These are unique components that uh, basically uh, create. A, a theological context in which we interact with the text from a social dimension and context that is unique and similar to the context in the Gospel of John. And so right. as, as, a, as a result, uh, I would say that um, there will be, uh, I don't want to call them insights, uh, just with advocating theology of humility, I would say there will be perspectives that hopefully to be tested and checked by others that are unique. You write here, I'm looking at your book uh, on page two, spilling over into page three. And for the sake of the, <clears throat> excuse me, for the sake of the viewers, um, you write here, however, it is fair to say that most contemporary Palestinian Christian perspectives, if not all, have been shaped by similar socio-political and religious events, for we live in the context of occupation, discrimination, uh, denominationalism, religious extremism, excuse me, Judaization, Islamization, wars, hatred, and tri a tribal patriarchal society. For Palestinian Christians, our questions have been born and grown to what they are in, in this context. And so, that that leads me to ask, and I'm sure many people watching have the same question, what does it actually mean to look at the Bible through Palestinian eyes, uh, in, and in particular the Gospel of John? How is that different from other lenses that people might approach the Gospel of John with? Yes, I think uh, this is a, a very important question, obviously, and it will take a lot of time to unpack, but I, will, I want to uh, at least highlight a few elements. Um, the issue of identity is very important. I want, first of all, to, uh, to, to, to point out that although Palestinians are one people, they are living into different political systems depending on where they are located. First of all, there are Palestinians who are living under a political system, unique political system in Gaza, which is different than the political system in the 1967 lands or in the basically the Palestinian territories today, which is much less than the 1967, but let's say for the sake of simplifying, the 1967 uh, land, the Palestinians there are living under the Palestinian Authority political system, and they are under occupation. There are also Palestinians who are Israeli citizens who are living under the 1948 land, and they are basically citizens, but they are living under a Jewish majority. Unlike the Palestinians who are living in the Palestinian territories, they are not living under Jewish majority. Right. And there are also Palestinians who are in the diaspora, who are having a different, each group have a different political program, even though they have similarities, but they also have their unique questions. Right. And so the Palestinians in the 1948 land, they are seeking equality because they are living as second-class citizens. There is political discrimination, 
There is legal discrimination, economic discrimination, and they are living as second-class citizens. The Palestinians in the uh, 1967 borders, they are seeking uh, uh, freedom and, and basically they want to end the occupation. The Palestinians in the Gaza, they want to end the siege and have a freedom of movement and mobility and work and, and many other things. And the Palestinians who are living outside, they want the right of return. And so each political program is unique to the subgroup. Right. Now, when I say Palestinian uh, uh, theology, I'm taking all that into consideration, but I'm focusing more on the Palestinian who are Israeli citizens. Okay. And the reason I'm saying that, because Palestinian theology have developed several writings uh, basically related to the 1967 Palestinians. But few have been, few works have been done addressing Palestinians who are living in the 1948 land. And so my book, The Gospel of John, is trying to contribute towards that, while my book, the land of Christ is mainly addressing Palestinians in the 1967 land. So I have worked on both sides, trying to theologize both contexts. Now, when it comes to what is unique in, in the perspective, both contexts, whether it is in the 1967 land or in the 1948 land, Christian Zionism have uh, provided a theological justification as well as Zionism in general, whether Jewish Zionism or political Zionism, have uh, provided theological justification or religious justification, let's say, if we want to, to look at the Jewish uh, Zionism, uh, religious justification for uh, the divine rights of the state of Israel over the land and over a building, a building a state that is Jewish in its nature. Because when you say a Jewish state, what about Christians? What about Muslims? And if you take it from a religious perspective, if you take it from a, an ethnic perspective, what about Arabs? What about Palestinians? So, so the thing is, uh, uh, the, the political vision of the state of Israel has strong religious implications. Now, when we read scriptures, these religious implications of building a kingdom for Israel, of building a Jewish state, I believe that the Gospel of John is addressing. Talk to us a and, little bit about... Okay. I believe that the Gospel of John is trying to relate the two Testaments, the Old Testament and the New Testament, at least the, the, the coming of the Christ, with the, uh, with the expectations of the Jews. Let me unpack it at least from Scripture the way I see it. The Gospel of John can be divided into two main parts. The first part is basically the, uh, basically the book of the signs, which is from chapter 1 to chapter 12. The second part is the book of the hour, which is from chapter 13 to chapter 21. The way I see the first part is that John is trying to deconstruct Pharisaic Judaism and reconstruct it in light of the coming of the Christ. What does this mean? Well, this means that the uh, certain Jews in the first century structured their reality around core components. These core components built their identity and their expectations and their religious as well as political and social programs. What are these core components? John structures them and reread every component in light of the coming of Christ. 
The first component that we see at least at, I mean, there are, I, I want to give at least the major ones now in the Gospel of John, is holy space. Holy space played a major uh, shaping force in structuring the identity of Pharisaic Judaism in particular, as well as the Sadducees. Maybe the Essenes were less interested in at least the, uh, the, 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 the temple. But this we is see... an idea that's there in the Hebrew scriptures. Holy space is an important yes. subject, but it evolves in uh, Second Temple Judaism. That's right. That's right. And so, and so we see that, for example, in John chapter 2, uh, we see there is discussion about holy space. And at the same time, John points out that Jesus is actually the temple. And so, and so this is, this is, uh, 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 this is like a, a theological bomb. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's very huge for, for people who have been focused their identity on an actual space. And then all of a sudden, they see that this space is connected to the person of Christ. Now, John does not stop there, but in John chapter 4, John even pushes that further in the discussion with the Samaritan woman. And the conflict about, uh, basically about the, the, the temple and the, the place of the temple and where you can worship God, John argues that it is God is spirit and it is neither in this temple nor in any other place, not in, not in Jerusalem, not in Samaria, that were worshipped because God is spirit and we worship God in spirit and in truth. So the nature of God defines the nature of worship. God is spirit, then you worship God in spirit. God is truth, then you worship God in truth. So, God, so John rereads the idea of holy space. Now John in the book of signs is actually connected all of it together. We cannot argue that it is, a, a, you know, like not structured in a, in, in a wise way, in, 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 a, in a planned way. We see the structure in more than one way in the Gospel of John. Let me give you an example. I wish we have the time to unpack at least this because the wedding of Cana, for example, plays a very significant role in launching the, uh, the Messianic age and the structure of John. But I want to give this as an illustration to point out how John, you know, there is a tapestry in John. There is a, a line that goes through it. Give you one example. The example of water, for example. In John chapter 2, we see water being transformed to wine. John chapter 3, we see being born from the water and the spirit. John chapter 4, we see water about with the Samaritan woman that wells up into living life. In John chapter 5, we see the pool and there is a water scene. In John chapter 6, we see Jesus walking on the water. In John chapter 7, we see whoever is thirsty, let him come and I'll give him water to drink. In John chapter 9, we see another water scene and another sign. And then we see also, you know, like in John chapter 11, John chapter 10, people going to the cleansing. John chapter 13, we see Jesus washing the feet of the disciples and telling uh, the, basically Peter, unless I wash you, wash your feet, you have no inheritance with me. And in John chapter 19, we see they stab Jesus and at the blood and water came out. Obviously, John is interested in water scenes. And there is a tapestry with it. So how does it play water in John chapter 2? In John chapter 2, which is interestingly missed by many commentators, I think it's a central point that launches the gospel. And uh, the point there is, there had six water jars, and Jesus said to them, fill the water jars to the brim. And so they filled it to the brim, 
and then says, now taste. And when they tasted, the water was transformed into wine. Now, why is this important? Because the water was used for cleansing. Okay, so what is the, uh, the point? The point is, at the wedding, people had water for cleansing. And they got the water from the water jars. Now, all the water jars are filled with water, and all of them were transformed into wine. So Jesus solved the problem that people have no more wine, but created a new problem. They don't have water. How are they going to be cleansed now? Which is going to be a crisis experience at, at, at a religious wedding. Exactly. And this is connected now to the cleansing of the temple in John, only in John. And it is connected to Jesus being the temple. And it is connected to rereading Holy Space. So now in John chapter 2 to 4, we see Holy Space being reread. And this can also be in launching also the mission in John, because we see John chapter uh, basically three in Jerusalem, John chapter four in Samaria, and then by the end of John chapter four, we see the Gentiles also going to all the nations. Another sign we see that uh, basically in Capernaum and going all around. So it is Jerusalem, Samaria to the ends. The mission is launching, but Holy Space is being now reread. John chapter five, Holy Time is being reread. It's about the Sabbath. And the Sabbath, basically, uh, what is the right time for God's eschatological age? Because the Sabbath is a foretaste of the eschatological age. The Sabbath is a foretaste of, of restructuring time around divine expectations. People were anticipating the divine Sabbath. And so Jesus says, basically, that the Sabbath starts with him. Resurrection time starts with him. Then we see rereading Holy History, John 6, 7, and 8. It's almost going back to the Exodus and to Moses. And we see basically the bread in John chapter 6, the, light, the water in John chapter 7, the, the, the rock that, that followed them in the wilderness, Paul basically explains it. And in John chapter 8, we see the light. Jesus is the light. But in both 6 and 7 and 8, this is like the experience of the Exodus as well as the experience of the wilderness where they experience the manna and they experience basically going out from Egypt with Moses and they experience also the rock in the wilderness and they experience the pillar of fire in the wilderness. All of this that was related to, to Israel, John insists it has to be related to Christ. So Christ is the bread. So Christ gives the water. So Christ is the light. But John not only insists that Christ is connected to Christ, he also universalizes it. It's not the bread of Israel. It's the bread of life of the whole world. It's not the light of Israel. It's the light for the whole world. And the water it's for all who wants to come and drink. And so John basically is trying to expand the expectations. He rereads holy history. He rereads holy space, holy time, holy history. But then also he rereads uh, basically holy community in John chapter 8. The Abrahamic community is reread in light of the coming of Christ. So John is saying, I want to reread Abraham in light of Christ. And so what is sonship and daughtership? Can it be redefined in light of Christ? John 8 actually redefines the relationship to Abraham in light of Christ. And so if you are truly the children of Abraham, you would basically do what Abraham did. Abraham rejoiced to see the Messiah, the Messianic age. 
Abraham rejoiced to see Christ and the discussion then becomes, you are less than 50 years old. Do you know, Abraham, this is impossible. And, and the, basically, Jesus says, before Abraham, I am. Before Abraham was, I am. And so he is claiming eternality. And as a result of this, they wanted to kill him because he is basically claiming something that only God can claim. And so, and so the thing is, again, John is expanding this reality, rereading holy community. So John is different than Paul. And this is why his unique voice needs to be heard. Paul is focusing on uh, uh, building bridges with the Jews, while John is focusing on building the identity of the followers, the Jewish followers of Jesus Christ, and going beyond structuring their new identity. And so John, basically, the way I understand John, he says, if you have Abraham, if you have Moses, if you have Jacob, if you have the temple, if you have the Exodus, if you have all these privileges, but you don't have Christ, you are lost. In fact, John is very, very, very uh, uh, sharp. He says, I think in John th chapter 3, maybe verse 36, I think he says, very, very difficult verse. If whoever has the Son has eternal life, but whoever does not have the son, the wrath of God will be upon them. And so, and so the thing is, uh, John is, is very uh, uh, strict about the centrality of Jesus Christ. So without Christ, you have nothing from John's perspective. And so John continues this struggle between the synagogue and the followers of Christ those who want to focus mainly on Moses without Christ and those who want to accept Moses and follow Christ. We see this tension in John 9. And this tension leads to a new reading of Holy Land. In John 10, the land now is being reread. The land is connected to Christ. Christ is the key to entering the good pasture. And, and we see uh, John is actually, the way I understand it, is rereading Ezekiel. Why do I say this? And, and Ezekiel is very, very significant text in Israel. You know, like the national anthem, the, uh, all inspired by Ezekiel, the, uh, the, a lot of Zionist thinking inspired by Ezekiel, especially Ezekiel 36, 37, and 38, you know, the dry bone vision and things like that. Now, what, what is, uh, uh, several commentators, in my opinion, have not paid sufficient attention is how John rereads Ezekiel. Why do I say this? Because in, in, uh, in Ezekiel 33, Ezekiel is talking about Abraham. Abraham was one and he inherited the land. And then in Ezekiel 34, we see Ezekiel is talking about, uh, about the good shepherd. And then in, and when he talks about the good shepherd, he talks basically about the bad shepherds and the good shepherd who will be uh, basically uh, uh, establishing the covenant. And then we see the dry bone vision after this in 36 and 37. And then we even in 37, we see also the good shepherd appearing again. And the good shepherd is a Davidic figure. And this Davidic figure, a David died. Basically, David died hundreds of years before Ezekiel. So this Davidic figure is still to come. Do you see this and, to be connected with the promise in 2 Samuel 7? Ab absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. And so, but what John does, John puts Abraham in John chapter 8, just like Ezekiel. Ezekiel talks about 
Abraham in Ezekiel 33. Then John talks about the good shepherd in, Ezekiel, in John 10. Just like Ezekiel, we see Ezekiel 34 and 37 talking about the Davidic figure as the good shepherd that brings uh, the two sides and make them one flock. And John talks about the one flock and the good shepherd. And then after Ezekiel talks about uh, Abraham and the good shepherd, Ezekiel also talks about the resurrection language that ends exile. And John talks about the resurrection language in, Ezekiel, in, in John chapter 11 with Lazarus. And so John is following the same motif, the same theme, but he is rereading what Ezekiel has done in light of the coming of Christ. And he is trying to argue that the new world that is coming, that was launched with the messianic age in John chapter 2, that was launched with the coming of Christ in John chapter 1, that, that God the Son became human, that, that the ladder of Jacob now is upon the Christ, and he is the one who would basically will enter the land and will bring, the, uh, uh, will bring things to fulfillment. And so he is the king of Israel. In him, things will happen. So John is taking that motif and trying to reread everything in light of the coming of Christ. Now, for me, this is very, very significant about the role of Israel being fulfilled in the Messiah, Jesus Christ. How the, the main components of Old Testament identity, which is temple, exodus, Sabbath. I mean, if you take these, this is the core identity of the followers of Moses. And, and so, and, and John is taking these core identities, connecting them to Christ. And he is expanding these core identities to include non-Jewish followers of Christ, whoever accept Jesus Christ. And so, this, and trying to restructure a new identity in Christ. Now, this new identity in Christ, for me, first of all, before I, I go to the second part, this, this, this is very important in my discussion with Christian Zionism. Because a lot of discussion have not looked at one gospel and trying to bring a biblical theology and, and, and make it part of this discussion between covenant theology and dispensational theology, and in particular between a, 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 a Zionist theology. And so, and so I want to bring the Gospel of John to this discussion. I want to bring how John structures its biblical theology, at least the way I'm arguing it does, to the discussion between dispensational versus covenant theology, as well as to the discussion with Christian Zionism. I am aware that dispensational theology is not identical with Christian Zionism, but I am saying that it needs to, the biblical theology of John, the way I'm presenting it, needs to be a, a, in discussion with all these different theologies. Um, now, once this is done, the question that I think John is presenting, what is our new identity in Christ? And how does this impact us as followers of Jesus living in Israel as Palestinians? Now, as Palestinian, the issue of land is very important. The issue of the temple is very important. The issue of religious days is very important. The issue of basically a historical a, a connect, connectedness to the land is very important. Uh, the issue of, of, of structuring our vision, whether it is ethnic or whether it's inclusive, it's very important. So I try to engage these uh, discussions as I relate to my Palestinian audience, how we understand these realities, because even until today, uh, people are, are fighting over the Temple Mount. So what would Christ's discussion with the Samaritan woman contribute to this 
socio-political realities we are having today. Even today in Israel, people are discussing um, whether they should enforce the Sabbath on everyone or not, how going to be structured. If they are going to have a Jewish state, what is the role of the Sabbath? And, and so this is part of the discussion. Even today, people discuss ethnicity, whether they are connected to Abraham by blood or not, and how does it relate, whether you are in or out, depending on how you are connected to Abraham. So this is another discussion, and so it's very important for, for Palestinian Christians and even for Messianic Jews, because many Messianic Jews, if they uh, uh, publicly admit that they are followers of Jesus, they are not considered any longer Jews by the law. And so... And how, does that, how does that affect them um, yeah, on a day-to-day -day basis? It is, it is, uh, it is, uh, it creates an identity uh, struggle and crisis because they want to be Jewish by their ethnicity, but then uh, if they uh, clearly and publicly try to uh, admit that they are uh, uh, followers of Jesus, then uh, if they are not citizens in Israel, they no longer have uh, the ability to come and 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 uh, emigrate to Israel as as Jews. Okay. And so this is an, an area. There are legal uh, uh, problems with it. Uh, they lose certain rights. So so again, this is a, a discussion where where uh, where the theology plays an important role on politics on. On, on the law, on legal rights, on the, on the vision of the country, on the voting, and many other aspects. So, so after struggling with this, the question is, what is our identity in Christ? How does it shape our socio-political realities today as Palestinian Christians, as followers of Jesus? John presents seven identities in, uh, in the second part of his book, uh, which is the book of glory or the book of the hour from chapter 13 to 21. And these seven identities are all uh, included in, uh, in being missional. John is very important for John that we are missional. This is uh, this is why, as for me as a Palestinian theologian, uh, I don't want only political justice or political peace. I want missional justice and missional peace. Missional justice is more than political justice. It does not exclude political justice, but it is bigger than political justice because I need to structure my vision of the coming age of, of the civilization, I would call it civilization of love, civilization of justice, civilization of equality, civilization of inclusion. This vision of the civilization I have is rooted in my understanding of the gospel. Now, are you, just for the sake of clarification, when you talk about missional justice, is it correct to say that you're speaking about a uh, reshaping one's worldview um, in such a way that you know there's concern for the other, whoever the other may be, um, rather Absolutely. than just putting laws in place for simply political ends? Yes, ab absolutely. It's um, um, the, the political agenda, I, I believe God is, is the best politician ever. He is, he is, his politics is rooted in righteousness. And so I'm not against uh, political programs, but I think that for the church, we need to advocate justice and peace and seek the best political programs that embody that. But we, we can't support a political program that basically takes social justice without righteousness. 
because we need to have the 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 holistic dimension in our relationship with god and that includes my personal relationship as well as the social justice relationship as well as the environmental dimension in the gospel so the gospel is not just at the social level as the horizontal level there is also the vertical level we need to honor jesus christ as lord and savior on a personal level as well as on a political and social level now the political programs cannot meet all these this holistic vision it can meet aspects of it and so for the church we need to uh, integrate both aspects in the mission of the kingdom that is coming and so the kingdom that is coming is the kingdom of justice that includes political justice but goes beyond it and that's that, that i call this missional justice so 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 when when within the missional justice we have seven identities in the gospel of john these identities i will mention them briefly maybe highlight a couple of elements uh, first we are people of love and that's john chapter 13 second we are people of the spirit and that's john 14 and 16 third we are people of the vine because the vine is christ rather than israel the way i see it and so or christ embodies israel does not replace israel but embodies israel and uh, we are persecuted people and this is important for me because in john 16 talking about the people of the followers of jesus as persecuted people and christ gives us a lot of uh, uh, instructions how to relate to uh, enmity and persecution we are people of unity and prayer in john 17 and we are people of the cross in john 18 and 19 and we are the people of resurrection in john 20 and 21 now this uh, uh, these uh, dimensions i don't want to look at them only from a, a, a typical evangelical perspective my relationship with catholics with orthodox with uh, uh, with others have expanded at least my understanding uh, uh, to include a um, socio-political realities and social dimensions in our theology so so i want to look for example at the cross not only as as a, a point of atonement i want to look at the cross from a theological point of view from a political point of view from a social point of view uh, uh, from different aspects let me elaborate that just give this example we are people of the cross what does it mean yeah, this, i mean this is fascinating too and because i think what people many people are hearing at least in the united states there is so little dialogue between evangelical christians and other streams of christianity catholicism orthodox and so on um so this is this is fascinating that you in what you're developing you're drawing from all of these different traditions and putting them in dialogue with one another yes i let me give you an example for example um the cross uh, in 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 uh, at least in in um, my evangelical training was focused on a christ dying for our sins and to and and taking our place and um, and that's that's true you know i'm not debating that's that's not true but i want to say other aspects that i've learned as i reflected on the cross for example the cross is the struggle between two socio-political approaches to peace one is rome and one is christ christ 
is wants to be the prince of peace and to bring peace to Israel and the world. Rome wants to bring peace. The way Rome brings peace, the Pax Romana, through killing the prophetic voice. If someone stands against Rome, Rome is willing to use violence and the cross to get rid of them. And so Christ was crucified because he is a threat to Rome. On the other hand, Christ goes to the cross to challenge the violence that Rome exercises, to be a public display of the violence that they do and a reminder that he is committed to love his enemies. Now, Christ goes to the cross not only to die for the world, which is true, and to fire my own, my own sins, which is true, but Christ is committed to loving his enemies even to the extent that he is willing to go to the cross to die for their own sake. What I hear you saying is that Jesus' crucifixion by the Romans is really ironic, in a sense, because from a Roman point of view, they're bringing peace by killing him. He's bringing peace by allowing himself to be killed. That's correct. That's correct. And, 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 and they have two different agendas for peace. One is violent agenda. The other is forgiveness and, and love through the cross. So now the cross, and I would call uh, this perhaps, uh, maybe there is a fancy word that I call it orthopathos. Orthopathos is different than orthodoxy and orthopraxis. Orthodoxy, what is right, what is wrong. Orthopraxis is basically to do the right thing uh, and act and behave correctly. But orthopathos is to suffer rightly. So Christ on the cross is suffering rightly for the sake of bringing liberation. And so, uh, and this is called orthopathos. It, it, you can find it all over the Sermon on the Mount. You can find it all over Scripture. You can find it in Romans 9 to 11 and many, many places in Scripture. But anyway, uh, uh, and, and so for those who are interested, you can just uh, Google my name on YouTube and put orthopathos you would find a whole lecture on it, just on, on this aspect. But, but that is an underlying assumption in my reading of the Gospel of John, at least, where, especially on the section on the cross. And, um, and when it comes to suffering, rightly, I would say the cross, and this is, I cite here, I cite uh, Moltmann, the cross re reflects the suffering God. And I would say uh, here that I'm arguing that the Trinity suffers. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yeah, so I'm, I'm arguing that the Father suffers differently than the Son, differently than the Holy Spirit. And, and the Father suffers by giving up something extremely precious as a sacrifice to bring peace to bring uh, uh, forgiveness, to bring uh, uh, the civilization of love to the reality, to bring the coming age. The son suffers because he is obeying the father and going through the program, sipping or drinking the cup of pain. And the spirit suffers as, uh, uh, in, 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 in solidarity with the son. Now, we might suffer sometimes like the father by giving up something very precious, sometimes by the son by obeying the father, and sometimes by the spirit by in solidarity with those who are suffering. But through our suffering, we are bringing in the kingdom. And, and, and we in Israel-Palestine, Jews and Palestinians, both have suffered. They have a history of suffering. 
perhaps differently, perhaps I'm not going to compare who suffered more and why, but I would say that both have suffered. But are they suffering rightly? And so with missional justice, we want to suffer rightly. And, and so it's, it's not suffering rightly does not mean, uh, it means suffering for the sake of your enemy. You give the other cheek. And so this is what I see in the cross. Now, how does this transform identity that to make us people of the cross? And how does it have political implications? In, in the book, The Gospel of John, I do argue that there are two kingdoms at display here. There is, on the one hand, Kayafa has a vision for a Jewish kingdom. We see this in, uh, in John, where Kayafa says, it is better for one to be sacrificed so that we don't lose our nation and our land. And, and, and Judas subscribed to this political vision, sacrifices Christ. On the other hand, we see another kingdom, a competing political agenda and social agenda, that is the kingdom of God that Christ is advocating. And this kingdom, in this kingdom, you love your enemy and you include them. And so, uh, but what, what you need to do, you need to have a new identity, an identity of love, not hatred, an identity of the spirit, an identity of being part of the vine, an identity of being willing to suffer rightly, to be persecuted for the sake of Christ and to be people of the cross, an identity of unity, where we are all a, a, as one, as, as John 17. And, and, and the, the, the issue of identity, I see it, for example, in, uh, in the struggle of Peter. Because on the one hand, you have Judas. On the one hand, you have Peter. Peter struggled to deny geographical identity. Because he is a Galilean. His accent is Galilean. And his ethical standards are Christian, as, as perhaps as a followers of Christ, basically as a Jew who followed Jesus Christ. Christianity was not yet in that sense today, but at least we say he is a Jew who followed Jesus Christ and subscribed to certain ethical standards. When he was tested, his accent became a problem. So his geographical and linguistic identities became a problem for him in being accepted. Now, this is very similar to people in Israel. When I speak Hebrew, my accent is, is an Arabic Hebrew. And my geography is basically also clearly like there are places in Israel where Arabs live, other places, there is segregation. And so my geographical identity, my linguistic identity, reveal me. And sometimes people try to hide their linguistic and their geographical identities in order to, to be part of the dominant community or the community who has power. Well, I think the show Arab Labor yeah. Uh, yeah. deals with that issue. And so I, 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 I take Peter as an example and, and try to discuss how does people, how does uh, Peter you know, fall into this temptation and what does Christ expect from him? And instead of denying his linguistic and geographical identity, uh, which led eventually to uh, uh, denying Christ himself. And, and so Christ, and, and to, to violate the ethical standards. And what I'm arguing is that he needs to sanctify his identities in Christ, to be willing to suffer for the sake of Christ rightly and to suffer for the sake of his opposers. And, and this basically uh, creates a new vision for my country where 
instead of writing always who is right and who is wrong, which is not, you know, uh, uh, I'm not trying to say stop doing that, but I'm trying to say there is also a wider way, a more holistic way of doing things. Ask yourself and your religious community, how can you be a blessing? Rather, how can you be right? And, and you Again, write about this on, I'm looking at page 29 of your book, and for the sake of the readers, if you'll permit me to read just a little, yeah. it, you write there, it says, this approach challenges the teachings of Juda uh, Judaism and Islam, and it also challenges the claim that the Temple Mount, with or without a temple, is the actual place where God will reside in the future. In short, the humanity of Jesus is the place where God and human beings meet, where we see the face of God. It is the space in which human beings reconcile with God. Humanity and divinity are fully reconciled in Jesus Christ, who is fully God and fully human, and he is the only way for such reconciliation. Now, this, to me, this is quite striking because in American evangelicalism, um, the, the term evangelical has in many ways become a political term. And that is not what you're advocating at all here. To be evangelical um, has a very different meaning for you based on what I just read. Would you agree with that? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. I think the term evangelical is very fluid uh, and, and it's, uh, it's really uh, sometimes very hard to pin. And I think... Uh, it's it's uh, it's unfortunate because some people will uh, will uh, will quickly accept it as if everyone is identical if you are evangelical and some people will will dismiss it quickly and saying you know if you are evangelical you are an extremist or whatever um, I say uh, the best thing is to try to allow every author to explain what does it mean for them in mm. terms when it comes to evangelical. That, that does not mean that there isn't a core component in defining the label. But, uh, but I would say that for me, the core component is, is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and a, a, a commitment to scriptures, uh, to the credibility and inspiration of scriptures as, as the final authority. So... Uh, so that's, that's the way I see evangelical. The other things uh, I might disagree with some of my brothers and sisters about, uh, but uh, uh, the more I read scripture, the more I see that uh, to, to be an evangelical is to, to advocate a holistic view of the kingdom of God and to bring about the civilization of love, of mercy, uh, of grace, and to be missional, in our approach, uh, reaching out to my Muslim brothers and sisters and to my uh, Jewish brothers and sisters with a heart of love that, uh, uh, that does not uh, uh, abandon justice and with a heart uh, that is full of justice, but not only political justice, missional justice that seeks the best interest of my neighbor and that is willing to uh, to be creative, to look for solutions, to, to bless. You know, um, uh, Chris, if, uh, I, I read scriptures for many years. And, um, and um, when I, uh, I was once uh, really uh, amazed as I read the book of Genesis, from chapters 1 to 11, all the problems of the world developed. And then in chapter 12, God starts providing the answer for the problems of the world. And, and, and the answers that God provided was amazing. If you look, the centrality of that answer is actually the word bless. And, and, and bless is not just uh, uh, to say nice things about someone. In, in Hebrew, the word barach, to, to bless, means to communicate divine life into a particular reality. If it is a physical reality, it brings actual life. If it is a psychological reality, it brings healing. If it is 
maybe a sinful reality. It brings forgiveness and and uh, a new life. You know, a, a new heart create within me, O oh God. And so, and so to to bless is actually politically we need a, a, a politics of blessing. Uh, we need politics of love. We need a new understanding of social reality that is rooted in Christ. So, so this is why I, am, I wrote this Gospel of John because I am not arguing that, you know, God wants to save your soul so that you can go to heaven. I'm arguing that God wants to bring heaven down to earth through your life, through being people of love, people of spirit, people of, uh, of the cross, people of resurrection. We, by living out these new identities, we are creating by God's grace and through his work through us, we are creating a new world. And this world can be political, can be social. So if we want to, for example, have politics of love, that means the laws are more inclusive. That means uh, uh, we are no longer defining a, a state by one ethnicity. Uh, uh, if we want to have, uh, uh, you know, like a willingness to suffer for the sake of bringing peace, that means th that we are uh, willing to, to include both Jews and Arabs and share the land and try to find solutions in which we can live together, uh, even if it means making painful sacrifices for the sake of bringing justice and peace for both groups. So uh, 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 many political agendas are rooted in one side right and the other is wrong. And in getting all the benefits for your own group, but I think the kingdom wants to get the best interest of all the involved parties, whether it is the oppressor or the oppressed. So we need to be committed to the best interest of every human being who is living in our country, in Israel, in Palestine. How to translate that politically? We need creative political solutions. It's not easy. But in order to move into that direction, the church needs to contribute as peacemakers. And so let's put this one step further. Before the Corona season, Israel had at least 3 million visitors every year. Maybe hundreds of thousands of evangelicals would come and visit Israel every year to pray in the land, to come. Many of these people are not aware of the local church, are not aware of the, uh, uh, the, the diverse political realities. They are not a force for peacemaking through their visit, through their contribution. I mean, imagine if these hundreds of thousands of people can be peacemakers in a, an area where there is war making. They can establish just two relationships with two different people and try to connect them. They can try to, uh, uh, you know, contribute to, through their visits to local churches to, to bring uh, the mission of the kingdom. So, so it is possible to change the reality on the land through many different ways. Now, the Gospel of John, the way I see it, can launch this discussion in our churches, in our places, can challenge our new identity in Christ, can help us to have a, a more holistic missional vision, and can help us to challenge Christian Zionism in ways that basically that is biblical and to bring to the fore ethical questions and identity questions, which John brings forth, and the centrality of Jesus Christ. The more Christ is at the center, I believe the closer we are to God's heart. And so we need to look at scriptures from this perspective. This is why I wrote this book, 
And of course, there are many details in the book. It's a small book, but it's hopefully can launch a perspective that is needed, in my opinion. As I listen to you talking about your vision, which is, uh, I know you're speaking to the Israeli-Palestinian context specifically, but it's so relevant for the United States um, and the church here in the United States. Um, the, the big obstacle in, in my mind is really something you mentioned earlier about our willingness to seek missional justice, to allow our, our worldview to be shaped. Um, my experience is that we live in a world, uh, certainly in the United States, uh, but I imagine it's very relevant in Israel and Palestine too, where politics, religion, culture, it's all, they're polarizing forces. They drive people apart. And so often uh, when the church gets involved, in my experience, it contributes to the polarization. And you're arguing for something very different here, that we need to be people who are willing to bring people back together, to unite, kind of like what Paul is doing in, um, in Ephesians with the breaking down of barriers and, and bringing together but it happens only in the person of Christ, is what you're saying. Yes, I think Christ is, uh, has, has made a socio-political revolution that is rooted in the civilization of love. Now, for me, uh, civilization of love includes justice. So you cannot love without justice. True love is just. True justice is loving. And so, and so the missional justice is not based on revenge, but it's based on, or it's not based or even on retributive justice. It's based on a, 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 a orthopathos, the cross, and willingness to seek the best interest of even your enemy, and bringing a civilization of love. This cannot be done apart from Christ. So I, I think we as followers of Jesus, we can create communities of forgiveness. Not only forgiveness for individuals, but also for communities. And we can create communities of love, communities of justice. And, 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 and the, 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 the fuel for fanning the flame of this community is our unity with Christ. And so the church has a, a unique perspective and is very much needed. You know, if there is a big epidemic, you need doctors. But if there is a lot of hatred and revenge, you need true Christians. And so followers of Jesus are needed in context of war zones, in context of lack of forgiveness. But they are needed not only as people who can speak big, big words, but who can really live out the gospel, to be a living gospel as the message of God to our community. And so uh, for me, this is what I try to do. It's not always easy, but I love my Jewish neighbor, I love my Palestinian neighbor. I, I love my Muslim neighbor. And I, want, I see every human being as a gift from God. And my vision is to, uh, uh, to be empowered by Jesus Christ to bring the kingdom of God. And I think John is a great place to, uh, uh, to explain that because I think John is doing just that. And... and uh, and, and John is, is uh, admittedly, by many scholars, it has a universal aspect. And that's what we see right from the beginning of the gospel, throughout the gospel. It's an inclusive vision that brings even the enemies like the Samaritan and the Jews together. Well, I just want to uh, once again remind the readers here, I'm going to hold it up, reading the gospel of John through Palestinian eyes, Johanna Katanasho, the dean of Nazareth Evangelical College, 
It is a, as he said, a short read, a fascinating read, and it is very well endorsed, I might add. There are some uh, uh, names of consequence on the back uh, who have written in support of this book. So I would encourage everyone to, uh, through whether through Amazon or through whatever your, uh, your chosen bookstore is, um, to pick up a copy of Reading the Gospel of John Through Palestinian Eyes. And uh, Reverend Dr. Katanasho, thank you so much for making the time uh, to spend with us today. Thank you, Chris. Blessings to you. Well, if you enjoyed this video, please be sure to subscribe to the channel, to ring the bell so that you can be notified when videos like this appear in the future. And please be sure to share this YouTube video on social media. Thanks so much, everybody. See you next time.